joining us uh, for this session. Uh, this is the first in a series of events uh, developed by President Johnson's office and the Divided Community Project, which is housed at the College of Law's Program on Dispute Resolution. Uh, I'm the deputy director of the project and am just narrating the logistics as uh, folks are admitted to the session. Today's event is part of the Education for Citizenship post-election dialogue series. It's the first event in that series. This is scheduled for November 10th from 6 to 7.30 and focused on difficult conversations for students. Uh, today's event is titled Unpacking the Presidential Election, How We Got Here and What Lies Ahead. You see some resources and the panelists on your screen share presently. And uh, if you have any questions throughout this conversation, we urge to put them into the chat function. We'll be mining the chat function for questions to ask the panelists uh, throughout today's conversation. And we'll also be using the chat function to send you a few resources to the election law program at Ohio State, the Divided Community Project, and sharing some checklists with you that the Divided Community Project has developed. So I see it is six o'clock now at the top of the hour. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to this uh, quick discussion. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to today's facilitator, Carl Stolid, co-director of the Divided Community Project. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good evening. My name is Carl Smallwood. I'm the co-director of the Divided Community Project at the Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University. In these times of conflict in communities, we help communities and their leaders plan to turn dispute resolution insights into, uh, into uh, lessons that the community leaders can use immediately to address community unrest. And it's a privilege tonight to have been asked by the Ohio State University and President Johnson to partner with them on this program, this Education for Citizenship Post-Election Dialogue. And tonight, as we're not quite 48 hours after the closing of polls on the East Coast in the presidential election of 2020, there are some things we know and some things we don't. Voting has ended. Many, many people cast votes, almost uh, records, uh, that haven't been equaled and the turnout was high and votes are still being counted. But as we sit here at six o'clock or 6.01 Eastern on November 5, we don't know who the next president will be. And I'm privileged to have as our guests tonight, four faculty members from Moritz Election Law at the Ohio State University. They're a nonpartisan research group. They educate and they reach out with programs and their faculty and staff uh, are experts in this area. Uh, you will hear about their accomplishments and I'm not gonna do justice to their accomplishments in introducing them, but let me tell you who's going to be with you tonight. Um, Ned Foley is a chair of constitutional law, the director of the election law program at Ohio State. And uh, in the last hour, he was on MSNBC, and in the next hour, he's going to be uh, leaving us again to go back uh, to do additional interviews. He's an NBC News election law analyst and a contributor to the Washington Post uh, on the opinion side. Steve Huffner is the O'Neill Professor in Law and Judicial Administration. He's the Director of the Legislation Clinic and the Deputy Director of the Election Law Program at Ohio State. Terry Enns is a clinical professor of law for the Legislation Clinic and a senior fellow in the election law clinic at Ohio State. And finally, Peter Shane. Peter Shane is a Davis chair in law at Moritz. He teaches constitutional law, legislation and regulation. And importantly, he also teaches about law and the presidency. So when we talk about what's going to happen with respect to this presidency, once the votes are tallied and we have an answer, uh, Peter will help us with those issues. Now we'd like to get a very quick sense of who's in the audience. So if you don't mind filling out a quick poll, uh, 
We simply would ask you to tell us whether you're a student, uh, undergraduate or graduate, uh, staff member, uh, et cetera. And that will tell us a little bit more about who our audience is. And as we begin to unpack the issues uh, uh, in this election, I thought I would give each of our panelists a, a minute or so, just about a minute, to give you some thoughts as we sit here tonight on Thursday, not knowing who the president is, about what we've seen and where we are. So, um, uh, Ned, if you don't mind going first, you'll need to unmute yourself. Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, hosting us, uh, Carl, and for my colleagues uh, to be here on this uh, perhaps pivotal day. Um, I mean, we normally think of uh, election day is pivotal. And, and, and maybe when we look back from next year, there'll be other moments ahead of us still tonight that will also seem pivotal. But um, you know, one of the things that I, makes me think tonight is pivotal is we're at a fork in the road about whether or not the election is gonna be decided based on the rule of law and existing procedures that we have for counting votes and appointing electors to the Electoral College pursuant to the system in place. That's the expectation. It's been that way for decades. That's why we should normally assume it to be that way. But there is agitation in our society. Even today, we've seen some of the demonstrations, some of the tweets and so forth, that would like to take the process out of the rule of law and into the hands of political contestation and hurly-burly and who knows where that would go. Uh, it would be a very different scenario than doing it by law. Um, and I think uh, tonight, tomorrow, the next hours are going to be important uh, to tell us which road, which path we end up on. So that's my top of mind thought at the moment. Thanks, Ned. Um, Terry, would you go next? Sure. Um, what, what I've been thinking about is just the process of waiting and why we're waiting. And the reason we're waiting is because we're planning to count all of the votes that were cast. And what's new and different about this election that's making it take longer is the increased number of ballots that were sent in by mail. And that process just takes longer. We always have it. We always have a process that, you know, you finish voting on election day and then you finish counting some days later. And we're just in the middle of that. And it's just more apparent this time because of the vastly increased number of mail ballots this election. Thank you, Jerry. Steve, go next. Sure. Thank you so much. I guess um, I will build on Terry briefly to say that the process of counting itself that we're in the middle of now is itself an extension of a relatively smooth set of processes this election. That is to say that although before the election, many of us in this field had various types of problems that we were worried to come to pass and we had helped think about how we might be prepared for them and what we would do if they arose, that things went pretty smoothly. That's not to say that everything was perfect. There were some glitches and that's normal carrying off an election is complicated and it always has little glitches here and there. But overall, it went smoothly. And in addition, I think the media has been helpful in making everybody aware that it has gone relatively smoothly and that there is a process for counting. And that's the stage we're at. And I would just conclude my opening thought by saying, I really hope that that same approach will persist even in this moment that Ned has said could be a kind of pivotal one tonight. That we're at a point at which if that framing is going to change, it might change, but I'm hopeful that people will just continue to be patient. Thank you. That, that sets the stage, I think, for Peter, who is uh, our presidential power expert and, and focuses on transition. So Peter, your opening thoughts. Well, thanks, Carl, and uh, thanks to you and thanks to my colleagues for, for having this conversation. Um, I've often said when I teach about the presidency that you know, for all the many extraordinary things that George Washington accomplished, 
there is nothing, there's no gift to the United States that he gave more important than stepping away from power peacefully at the end of the second term. Of course, he was not constitutionally required to do that. It was probably not the contemporary expectation that presidents would do that. But that set a norm that has served the United States incredibly well over you know, more than two centuries. I've used the word norm, which has come up a lot during the last four years. Norms are you know, the, uh, the customary modes of behavior that have been worked out through, through time to enable uh, people to get along even without the force of law. And um, I think what I've been thinking about in part because I, I think you know, it is correct, we, we do not formally know who the next president of the United States is. It looks as if we can reasonably uh, anticipate what's, what's going to happen with the vote counts that are proceeding as they've been proceeding. And if the direction that, uh, that we follow is the direction I anticipate, which is that there will be a transition between uh, a Trump administration and a Biden administration, the transition period is also one that has been deeply affected in the past by constructive norms. There, you know, there's law that sets up a framework for the transition that authorizes the executive branch to be helpful to an incoming president. But a lot of the success of a transition depends on things like the free exchange of information, a cooperative sharing of records, and so forth. Um, and you know, if, if for whatever reason uh, those norms are not observed, there's no really good way to enforce them legally. And uh, the moment could be much more chaotic uh, and much less uh, uh, prop propitious for the American people than would otherwise be the case. Well, thank you for setting the stage for us. I, I, let's, let's now take them in order, beginning with where we are tonight, uh, which is in the process of, of counting votes still. And, and it seems the national attention has turned from some of the 50 states where uh, voting or where counting may still be going on, but, but the outcome is not in doubt to a few states where there seems to be an issue. So can, can we focus for a minute on that? I know you at, at the election law are following this very closely. Uh, and I hope Bill will put into the chat function where they can find you um, at OSU. But can you talk about you know, where we're now focused and, and what we're focused on in terms of, of counting votes and, and perhaps challenging the counts of those votes? Sure, Who, which one of us would- Well, Ned, you want to get started? This is going to be a conversation. I hope this will be a conversation. Absolutely. Really more than my, uh, my asking questions simply. Yeah, um, well, it is a multi-state process. Um, of course, you know, us in the law world, we, we keep reminding ourselves and anybody who's willing to listen that even in the um, states that aren't the focal point, there still is going to be the certification, uh, the official certification of the canvassing process. So we don't have any, we don't have definitive results in any state yet. Um, but as a practical matter, obviously, uh, you know, all the attention is focused on uh, on the states that are in the news. But I do think it is worth pointing out, um, you know, what is going on with Arizona, because, you know, Arizona is a state that uh, Fox News actually called uh, for Vice President Biden, you know, quite early on. And the AP, uh, the Associated Press also called uh Arizona for, for Biden. And of course, it may end up that way, and, and Biden is still ahead. But uh, it, it, it's just an example. Of how we have to remind ourselves that, that what the networks do is simply projections. And, and the, in, in my judgment, actually, the, the Associated Press has, has done a bit of a disservice to the country, unfortunately, um, by on its website and in its characterization. Um, claiming that they, you know, declare winners. They they say they don't do projections. They just declare winners, and and uh, but they well, don't. Let me let me ask you there, Ned. Sorry to interrupt you, but but who who then does declare? I mean, we've seen some of these state officials on television, the secretaries of state and the attorneys general, and those sorts of folks. Who actually does declare what the final vote is in a state? Well, Congress Congress has the official authority to declare the president elect. 
and it happens pursuant to the 12th Amendment in a special joint session of Congress. The date is January 6th because Congress gets to set the date. Now, of course, that's a long time from now and we're an impatient people. And we also sort of think that uh, we as citizens vote for president. And of course, we our, our whole presidential election process is this accumulation over decades and decades of rules and, as Peter said, norms that um, gives us something of a collective misunderstanding of the process. And the media, you know, wants to, I mean, people are talking about having a president elect tonight, perhaps, depending upon what might happen in Pennsylvania. Um, that's still a projection if that happens tonight. Uh, we will have an official president elect on January 6th. Okay. And up until that time, we're gonna have different stages of the process that will lead us to that. Okay. And as citizens, we should understand the complexity of that. And, but and can Steve, I offer, you want to jump in here, yeah. Yeah, I just want to offer one sort of refinement in there, though, which is that's all correct, but it's also part of that process that a secretary of state in most states is the official who will announce the results of November 3rd in that election in that state. And so we're waiting for that to be the official declaration of what a given state has done. And what Congress then will do is to aggregate what happens. And it's a complicated process to get us there. But right now, what we're really waiting for are just unofficial results that would be then turned into official results after the canvas for that Secretary of State or other Chief Elections Officer to use. Yes, but I think it's even still important to understand that, it, that what it, when a Secretary of State will certify a result in the state. That's the certification of the popular vote in that state, that under state law is gonna be the basis for the appointment of the electors of that state. It's not a declaration nationally of a president elect, it's a declaration of, of which slate of electors won the popular vote in that state. And of course we have an expectation that that popular vote will translate into the state's electoral vote smoothly. And the US Supreme Court has helped us this year by um, having the, the possibility of states uh, avoiding what are sometimes called faithless electors by making it clear that states, if they want to, can empower themselves to prevent a faithless elector. But only about 15 states have taken advantage of that. Um, and and again, Ned, I don't want to lead us. Ned, I, I think you're getting into some of the electoral college. Let's let's get to that in just a minute. Let's let's talk for a minute first about what where we are in terms of getting the votes. Because what's happened here and, and what we are watching on television is people in states counting votes. And is that a normal process at this stage, Terry? Absolutely. Um, you know, election day is the day of the election. But prior to that, those states that allow processing of absentee ballots can start processing those ballots. So what we're waiting on now is several categories of ballots that are still being processed. One of those are the, the in some states, the late arriving, um, the most recently arrived mail ballots. In some states, they're not even allowed to start processing those mail ballots until election day. So that's one of the categories. They're matching signatures. They're making sure that the person who claimed to make this vote was a legitimate voter. And they're, you know, they're working on that before they take those ballots out and feed them into the counter. And the other category of ballots that they're working on are if you show up at the polling place and your name is not on the list of registered voters or um, you moved and you didn't update your address, you are still allowed to vote a provisional ballot and that gets put aside. And once things are verified or you come back with proper ID or something like that, then that can be fed in. So it's those kinds of votes that are being processed still, and they're always being processed at the same stage for every election. Now, was there was there anything uh, you know in in time of COVID, a lot of people voting ahead of time? Uh, it seemed that in some of these states, you had one result when they would count a certain type of ballot or be any part, and then what we would watch on television is some of the numbers change. Was that? A surprise to you, or was that expected? I'd say it was not a surprise. I mean, we have always seen different types of uh, 
ballots or really different demographic groups that tend to gravitate for different voting methods. So it's not a surprise. Okay. One, one interesting example, I mean, part of what was so unusual about the run-up to, to the election is that you had the president leading one party um, trying to cast doubt on uh, the appropriateness of mail-in ballots. And, you know, and the other party uh, urging their members and, their, and you know, and, and uh, Vice President Biden supporters to vote as early as possible and to use, you know, mail balloting uh, if that was the, uh, if that seemed the most appropriate to their personal circumstances, but certainly to vote early. Now, what predictably happened is that, you know, in a number of states, the, the votes, if the state, if the state's rules provided that the first votes to be counted were the same day election were returns, then they often tended to skew towards President Trump. And then when they started counting the mail-in ballots, um, suddenly the, the lead uh, either shrunk or shifted. In Arizona, you had something of the opposite situation because Mar Arizona, for, for whatever you know, local traditional reasons, has long been a state that favors mail-in mail voting. And so as it happens, you, there was not at all that, uh, that kind of a skew. I mean, not to anything to that level. In fact, to some extent, um, uh, Vice President Biden's lead that led to the Fox announcement uh, or calling the state um, was shrinking because President Trump was doing better there uh, in the mail-in votes because it was a traditional uh, you know, mail in state. What it, it, the, I, I think it, we would not ordinarily have expected to see quite so dramatic a shift from red to blue or blue to red, um, but for the politicization over the very issue of how you should vote, uh, which was so unusual. Yeah, and I, and I know um, at, at seven o'clock tonight, Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, is going to announce another set of ballots having been counted. So at that point, the numbers will change again. Mm -hmm. Annette, were you going to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to um, come in. And, after the 2018 midterms, um, you know, someone who watches elections and has done so for a, a time, I was worried because I saw the president tweeting about races in Florida in particular, also Arizona too, where the numbers were shifting um, they didn't actually overturn the results of the governor's election and the U.S. Senate election in Florida from the election night tallies to subsequent final certification, but uh, it did overturn the result in the Arizona Senate race of, of 2018. And so it was possible for me to analyze what would happen if the very same thing occurred this year in the presidential election. Now, this was before COVID and before the politicization of vote by mail to the degree that Peter is talking about, but there was already the seeds of the phenomenon that has been unfolding uh, over the last couple of days now. Um, and I, in a sort of an exercise of uh, not quite science fiction, but I sort of sketched out a, a narrative scenario of what might happen if the presidential election was caught up uh, in the kind of issue that the 2018 election was caught up in. And, you know, and the whole purpose of me doing that was to try to avoid a problem because I could foresee a problem developing if, if, and it could snowball if it started off on the wrong foot, so to speak. Um, and I regret to say that unfortunately is it the, the narrative over the last uh, 24 to 48 hours is, is, is regrettably true to the script that I wanted to be fiction and not reality, but we'll see how it all unfolds. But, but the structure of the narrative was, you know, election night tallies would favor the president and the president would therefore try to pronounce through tw Twitter, stop the count, don't allow any more ballots to be counted that weren't election night ballots. And even though they're perfectly valid votes entitled to be counted, uh, and yet he has been tweeting in that way, the vote, the administrative processes are doing their job. Um, and uh, will, and they, will, they, will, they will take all the steps necessary to certify. But we're already seeing agitation 
you know, in terms of what's happened in Detroit and in Nevada, where um, protests are taking place to try to be disruptive of the of the normal legal process. So far, the so far the rule of law is still prevailing, and that is a good thing. Well, um, that that but, maybe but, gives us a, a way to turn Ned to the to the next thing, which is I guess there was one quick question uh, in the chat room, which was: Are there any legal consequences if a candidate claims victory when they haven't won? Uh, I think we're all shaking our heads no. No, okay. Right, <laughs> because, no, a, a president's term uh, is set by the Constitution. Um, there, there will be the beginning of a presidential term at noon on January 20th, 2021. The person who takes the oath will be the president of the United States. Um, it will not make a difference what uh, that person's opponent has said prior in terms of you know who exercises power. Okay. But... Again, you know, Ned referred uh, earlier to, you know, what undoubtedly is a kind of, uh, it, it's hard to believe the entire public hasn't mastered all the details <laughs> that have been obsessing us. But there is, you know, I think what you called uh, a kind of collective misapprehension that we will have a president elect as soon as, you know, all of the states have been called tonight. That is a misapprehension in terms of, you know, the, the process and, and, you know, Ned is, I mean, Ned's book is called uh, Ballot Battles. I mean, he's, you've studied all of these contested elections. But I do think part of the misapprehension is fed not just by the media, but by the history of norms. That is, we have not experienced uh, intentional attempts to disrupt the flow. I mean, you know, some, yes, but nothing, no or campaign orchestrated by an incumbent president to disturb the, the flow from informal vote count to canvas, et cetera, et cetera, in the way that is currently happening. And, um, you know, I, it, you know what's, what keeps me up at night about the rule of law is, you know, how much energy is gonna be devoted to strategies directed to undermining the smooth flow that is created, the misapprehension that whoever appears now to have won the pot, you know, the vote in each state for that state's electors will get those sta that state's electors and whoever gets the 270 gets to be president. You know, I, I brought my copy of the constitution with me when, when we talk about norms. I mean, for those of you watching who didn't go to law school, the constitution is not a huge book. Uh, it's very small. Uh, these people are expert in, in, in all of the law that has flowed from this beginning and the process we're currently engaged in uh, has precedent for hundreds of years, but largely because we've been able to maintain our, our belief in the structure that was created by this constitution. Now, there have been challenges, you know, in addition to tweeting about count the votes here and don't count the votes there, there have been challenges in court. So that while the process of counting is still going on, there have been court cases to um, either stop the counting or to change who, which votes we count or uh, you, I know you're monitoring all of that kind of court challenge as well. Um, and I don't know, you know, Terry, Steve, if, if one of you is, wants to jump in and sort of talk a little bit about where we are, how, how quickly do these court cases get decided? Uh, and who decides them? Steve, can I do my arm waving thing? So I do this, I like to remind people that, you know, Carl, you just showed us the U.S. Constitution which governs election law, but we've got so the US Constitution and cases interpreting that and federal congressional statutes, cases interpreting those. But we also have the whole state level of state constitutions and state cases and state statutes. And some of what, Steve, if you're gonna talk about the cases, some of those have to do kind of with the intersection between those. Some of those are in one system, some in the other, some at the intersection. And Currently, the reason this whole arena is so complicated is because of that multiple system and multiple layers of rules that we're, we're working with. Thanks, Jerry. 
And Carl, I would just say that there are some cases that have been brought since election day that have been quickly dismissed as not having any merit. There are others that have produced some modest relief. In particular, there was a case in Pennsylvania that the Trump campaign brought arguing that they were entitled to enhanced opportunities to observe the counting of the ballots and the court agreed essentially and let them have some additional opportunities. But those weren't really cases to stop the vote counting. And I think it's a misunderstanding to view them that way. They were cases to clarify and arguably enforce the rules for the counting, which is completely different than a claim that the counting should stop. Um, and there would be no case that would succeed to stop the counting. And then there may be cases after the counting has concluded claiming that something went wrong and the counting should be adjusted or corrected or something. And we don't know yet about that category in any particular way. And, you know, assuming that the counting uh, goes on, how, how long does this process continue? What's, what's the timeline look like here? So, I mean, I'll say one thing and then Ned can talk about the electoral college part, perhaps. Yeah. The, the, the first stage of this comes back to Terry's observation that states have a fundamental role here and each state has made its own decision. And that includes decisions about the time frame with which a state processes and conducts the canvassing of its votes. So in some states that canvas is supposed to be done in a week, in other states it's two weeks, in a few states it's longer yet than that. Uh, but when it comes to a presidential election, they all have to worry about getting that work done in time to have appointed their presidential electors to meet a congressionally imposed timetable. And maybe, Ned, do you want to talk a little more about Yeah, that? I guess just, just Ned, before you do, let me just ask this question, because again, I, I think there may be some people who assume it all fits together. Uh, this isn't simply a referendum, is it? It isn't just whoever gets the most votes nationally becomes president. It's a, it's a different process than that, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely, right. We. We do not have a national popular vote as our method for electing a president. If we did, at that point, I, Vice President Biden would have been declared president-elect already, right? I mean, I haven't looked at the last figures, but he was above 50% in the national popular vote, you know, with every expectation that that lead will grow as more votes come in, particularly from California, which tends to be some of the last reporting states. So. Um, Instead, we have our electoral college system, which votes on a state by state basis. And it's necessary to win to get 270 electoral votes. The constitution speaks in terms of a majority of, uh, of votes from electors appointed um, because there are 538 electors, 270 is the, is the majority. Um, and, and so the electoral college is, they, they are the ones who vote for president, we as citizens, vote you know for we do you know on the ballot it looks like we're voting for a president but uh, the the legal machinery is translating our preferences for the presidential candidates into the appointment of presidential electors uh, on a state by state basis uh, and the constitution requires that the electors in each state meet on the same day throughout the united states congress can pick the date Congress has chosen Monday, December 14, as that date. That's the real date of the presidential election. You know, um, I mean, I'm being a little silly about it, but that is actually the official election for the office of presidency undertaken by the electors. And, and, and our vote on November 3rd and in the November 3rd process is preliminary to that. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's an important deadline, that deadline of, of December 14. Uh, in fact, um, that the, the constitutional requirement of all electors meeting the same on the same day throughout the nation was um, determinative to how Hayes prevailed against Tilden in our most disputed election of 1876. And we could discuss the details if we wanted to, but I say that just to underscore that that is an important deadline. There's another date that Congress has set that's six days ahead of that. So that's Tuesday, December 8. And sometimes it's called the safe harbor deadline, 
and that safe harbor concept is important. It's, it's not actually a requirement that states meet that deadline, but it's very advantageous if they do. If, they, if the states sort of uh, get into that safe harbor status, Congress has promised to accept as conclusive whatever the state has determined. There's a couple of conditions. The first condition is meeting that deadline of, of Tuesday, December 8th. And the second condition is using law that exists at the time the votes are cast in order to count those votes. So you can't change the rules for counting ballots after they've been cast. But if you use pre-existing law and, you, you, and the state achieves a final determination of its popular vote by that date, Congress will accept it as conclusive. So yes, the states have their own subsidiary deadlines, but it, 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 as long as they finish counting the popular vote by Tuesday, December 8, and, and use existing law, then that's conclusive, at least or so Congress has promised. So one thing, um, the out process that Ned just outlined uh, you know, underscores a point that Terry was making, which is that even though we think, you know, this is, this is all about electing the president to head the federal government, the process is very significantly controlled by state law. Um, you know, it's often said we have not one election, but 51 elections, 50 states in the District of Columbia. And one issue uh, that has that was raised in litigation concerning Pennsylvania before election day, uh, the Supreme Court did not rule on this, but uh, several justices suggested the issue could come back. Um, is you know is whether it becomes an issue of federal law, how the courts of a state interpret what the state legislature has done in setting the rules for choosing electors. So the, the constitution provides that the electors are to be chosen in each state uh, uh, in such manner as the legislature shall, uh, shall declare. Now, one way of reading that is that you know, state legislatures, you know, they act, but they act pursuant to state constitutions. Um, and often they act in ways that uh, aren't, aren't vague or you know, ambiguous. And so um, sometimes resort will be had to the state courts to figure out what the state law actually is. And sometimes you have to reconcile competing provisions of a statute or the statute in the constitution. Um, and uh, you know, this was, of course, famously an issue in Bush versus Gore. So one might have thought that this would be a completely an issue of state law. But some justices and um, a, an opinion that Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote in Bush versus Gore for himself and two others said that there actually would be a federal issue um, with regard to whether or not a state court's interpretation of, uh, of what the state legislature had done had so far departed from what the state legislature actually decreed as to have violated what the state legislature's role was to be under the federal constitution. And the argument was raised with regard to Pennsylvania that a decision of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to allow um, the counting of ballots that arrived uh, uh, two or three days later than the statutory deadline uh, actually raised a federal issue um, because the statute you know, provided a, a date and a time and uh, the court went beyond it for you know, reasoning from the dictates of the Pennsylvania constitution, the emergency powers uh, that they thought triggered by the pandemic and so forth. Um, now it may be that the, the number of ballots that are actually counted in a, because of that, that wouldn't have been counted otherwise would be relatively small and not outcome determinative in any sense. But, but that is the kind of issue, you know, when, when Terry you know, referred to the intersection of state and federal law and the complexities that could arise in court, that, that is um, one of the anxiety provoking examples. Well, when you talk about anxiety provoking examples, I, I know this is, a, this is a complex area and you've studied it and I don't wanna scare anybody. <laughs> but uh, I know you've thought about some of the things, that, some of the levers, some of the kinds of challenges that might now be raised uh, concerning 
what we expect will be a, uh, a, a perfectly valid, carefully uh, done, secure election in 51 jurisdictions in this country. Um, but I don't know whether you can talk about that for just a minute, but as I said, I, I'm really, I, I think we don't wanna spin off into things that are never going to happen. Are there, are there concerns about things that, that we expect the courts will put to bed here in the next couple of weeks? Well, if I can just jump in quickly to um, underscore what Peter was saying, I think, um, I think it's uh, unlikely that the, the, the number of ballots affected by this three-day deadline will be outcome determinative in Pennsylvania, but it's at least theoretically possible. The, the one note of caution I would mention in this discussion of this is that even if the US Supreme Court in a majority opinion embraces the theory of federal constitutional interpretation that Chief Justice Rehnquist articulated uh, in Bush versus Gore, as Peter suggested, I don't think it automatically follows from that that ballots will be invalidated pursuant to that theory. Um, because there were voters who cast votes in the period of time where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision was operative, even if it ultimately gets overturned. And so voters were relying in good faith on the law as it existed at the time that they cast their votes. And there is a longstanding due process principles of reliance and, and good faith that, you know, so a valid voter um, should be able to kind of rely on, on, on what its own court system says. And we saw a signal out of South Carolina in a, in a parallel case indicating that even conservative justices like the Chief Justice Roberts or Justice Kavanaugh are unwilling to invalidate votes if the mistake was not the voter's mistake, but local officials misunderstanding their role. You know, I can't be 100% sure that that's how it would play out, but um, I think there's a reason to believe that, that the votes cast in Pennsylvania by eligible voters will ultimately be counted, regardless of which way this, you know, larger legal theory, theory goes. Um, so to call to your point, I, I do think, you know, it will be relatively straightforward, even if it takes longer than people would like, you know, for the legal um, uh, regimes of all 51 jurisdictions, the 50 states and District of Columbia, they will, they will achieve a final definitive legal result as to who won the popular vote in each state. And, and if the norm, as Peter mentioned, holds true, that'll be the end of the matter. And we won't have to wait till January for Congress to, to settle it. it we, will, we will know that the system worked as it's to be expected. Um, and again, I hope the idea of, of anybody trying to undermine that norm is not very realistic. So I don't wanna try to, again, scare people, but unfortunately, I think I would be dishonest if I said that there's no risk whatsoever of the normal process being undermined this this year. I mean, we, we've seen well, we've we've seen we've seen many norms um, shattered in the last few years, and things we didn't think would occur uh, occur. Steve, did did you have uh, something on on this subject as well? Well, it was just reminding me of the importance of of norms that Peter started with at the outset. And I was actually thinking of it in a slightly different vein. I mean, I know that one of our questions is uh, about the way in which something a candidate or an incumbent might say could disrupt the whole system. Uh, and in fact, there's a, the question was, is it, is it legal or how can it be legal? because it certainly isn't ethical for a sitting president to rile up pe people to take action against election officials. And I think the point really here is it may be irresponsible without being illegal. There's not really a, a legal constraint. The president has a first amendment right to say things that may be deeply irresponsible. So can anything be done to try to, um, from 
prevent or not or to protect safety and security in our democracy it does come down to norms as much as to law more generally well then peter let's 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 assume the timeline plays out as as ned described it um that uh the electors vote on on december 14 and the Congress certifies the results on January 6. January 20 is inauguration day. Uh, what happens then, I guess, or, or what happens between now and then, assuming that we know who the next president will be, duly elected, certified, uh, pursuant to the Electoral College, there's this period of, of transition um, between those events and January 20. What, uh, what are the limits of the president's power to continue to do things he's currently doing? Uh, to fail to cooperate or provide uh, access to things to make the transition easier? Well, you know, the, the one limit is, is time. Um, but, uh, you know, it is, it is not unusual uh, in, the, in what are called the lame duck months of any presidential administration for a president to exercise uh, a pardon power uh, with regard to individuals whose, uh, whose pardons would otherwise be controversial. Um, uh, president Clinton, I think much to his regret, at least as he has expressed it later, um, you know, pardoned someone in, you know, who for politically uh, questionable reasons um, and uh, you know, that sort of has cast a kind of pall over his last days in the presidency, but there, you know, there have been other examples to be sure. Um, so the, the thing about, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what difference does it make if the president concedes or does not concede? And I, I wanna preface this by saying, I have no inside knowledge of, of who's on the Biden transition team, how they're operating, what they've been doing. But I will say that Congress has been persuaded for quite some time that the process of, you know, being or preparing yourself to start on January 20th is so complex that it enacted a law in 2010 that actually extended the transition to the pre-election transition. Um, there, both the Biden and Trump people have been engaged in activity for many months. In, in anticipation of you know, what would happen if there has to be a transition. So this is where, again, cooperation is critical. I played I, 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 a sliver of a minor role in the um, Obama transition in 2008. Um, and a big, but what that sliver allowed me to see was how dependent that transition was on access to information. All, there was a, an extensive debriefing of all agency heads and significant staff, um, you know, a, an enormous sharing of records, an attempt to distill kind of all of the kind of controversies facing the administration. And you can imagine, particularly in the area of national security, how urgent this is. You know, the last thing you want is a 60 second decisional void with respect to knowing how best to protect our national security. You know, you, you don't want any slippage there. Um, so, you know, the president saying, I'm still going to be the president no matter what, you know, that's, you know, saying whatever he wants to say. But if he's directing people in his administration not to share information, um, that could have very dire consequences and there's no real legal recourse. You, you know, you've asked us not, or you've expressed the hope that people wouldn't walk away too scared. Um, but I, I do want to sort of make one other point about you know, the rule of law and, and norms. And that is the rule of law generally is able to operate successfully because you can count on people having relatively predictable incentives as office holders. You know, partly it's allegiance to their office. You know, they want to discharge their office honorably regardless of party. Um, that's very important. But partly it's an expectation that if I'm an office holder and I behave irresponsibly, I'm gonna pay a price for that. I'm gonna pay a price for it at the polls. Um, and so what I've wondered about, and this goes back to the power of state legislatures, um, Terry's actually worked for the state legislature. Maybe you have some insight into this. 
But I'm wondering because there are friends of the president, family members of the president, urging Republican legislatures in these swing states, if need be, to, to submit their own uh, roster of candidates, uh, of electors, irrespective of what the popular vote uh, says. And I guess one legal question I have is, it, would it, do they require the governor's signature? If so, it's not going to happen in Pennsylvania or Nevada, which have uh, Democratic governors, but Arizona and Georgia, it's a different story. So I don't know, Terry, if your experience, you know, this is not going to be an issue in the Ohio legislature this year because it's controlled by Republicans and President Trump uh, prevailed in the popular vote. Should I be worried about this as to other states? I, I try not to worry about it, but I know Ned spends a lot of time worrying about it and writing about it and thinking about it. So um, I'm going to toss that one to Ned. He had a full head of hair before the election. Right. <laughs> before he started thinking about legislatures and governors and what they might do. Oh. Yeah, well, I, I am worried for, for, I guess, a couple of reasons. One is, um, although we've been talking about presidential elections, um, I'm going to mention the term gerrymandering, um, which some people know what that means. Other people may not have heard of it. Gerrymandering is the manipulation of the drawing of legislative districts that happens every 10 years is required when there's a new census. And it's it's a pejorative term, you know, to, it, it comes early in American history. Um, and, and the key concept is that it is manipulation, it's distortion. And what it is, it's incumbent politicians in the state legislature trying to manipulate the rules of the electoral process to basically subvert the will of the voters for the benefit of the incumbents, either just because they're incumbents or more often than not, uh, the incumbents of one particular party who happened to control the legislature at a particular time. You know, We've had this throughout American history uh, to varying degrees, uh, but it's become more and more of a pathology, uh, in part because of technology and supercomputers, but part because of norms and erosion of norms. Democracy cannot work without a sense of fair play, right? A, a, a competitive democracy is of necessity uh, either a two-party system or a multi-party system, because a one-party system is tyranny. It means you don't have pluralism and vibrant disagreement. Hopefully the disagreements are not so severe that it results in a rupture of society like our civil war in 1860, but hopefully you can, you're gonna have disagreement about tax policy or healthcare policy or environment, but you, you have to keep those policy disagreements within a system of fair competition, fair electoral competition, that's governed by fair play. Well, gerrymandering is the opposite of fair play. It's, it's the subversion of fair play. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse, decade after decade. And what we're witnessing right now is whether that attitude is going to affect the appointment of a presidential elect electors. Because if state legislatures attempt to make this move, it will be with the same attitude that they could get away with gerrymandering. So maybe they can get away with this, right? The voters wanted one thing in their state, but you know what? We, the incumbents of a particular party, we want something else. And maybe we can get away with manipulating the process to our team's advantage, despite the will of the electorate. Well, that's what gerrymandering is. And that's the move that at least has been put on the table. I hope it doesn't succeed. I hope there's a severe and serious pushback to say that, wait a second, we run elections for the sake of the voters so that the voters get their will. But that's what's at stake at this moment. Um, and the, the presidential election may get gerrymandered, if you will. It won't be because of district lines, but it will be because of the distortion and manipulation of the rules for partisan and incumbency advantage. Um, can well, me, they get away me, with it? Let me ask a question, Ned, if I may, because I, I think it, it sort of brings us um, to a point that's, that's, that's very important, and that is confidence in the, the election process. And, you know, we've spent the last 50 minutes talking about a presidential election that was on every ballot. But every single ballot that a voter voted on this year contained other candidates. 
it can, there were there were local, city, county, state candidates. There were issues. There were all kinds of things people voted on, and they were all part of the same ballot, on which they either marked Donald Trump or Joe Biden or other. And what I guess when we talk about having confidence, I know there's there's a voice that would like for people to change the entire system with respect to one race. But there were so many other people running, so many other issues that hang in the balance. And if, if we invalidate the one, don't we cast out all of the others with it? Well, I'm, I'm interested what other people have to say. I mean, as a matter of logical consistency, I think you make an important point, right? I mean, if the claim is somehow the system failed for, again, none of this is really evidence-based of claims of fraud or what have you, um, but, but a, a state legislature could attempt to assert the authority of appointing electors directly without attempting to repudiate the counting of votes for city council or state legislature or what have you. They just would exercise selective power. Now they're gonna get pushback and governors will say, hey, in a state like Pennsylvania, they'll say, I need to be part of the process. But my research tells me that what's important is what gets sent to Congress for that January 6th meeting. Because even if as a matter of federal or state law, a legislature is not entitled to do this unilaterally without gubernatorial participation, if the legislature tries to do this and submits its claim to Congress, then it will be Congress's decision whether to accept that claim or reject the claim. So at some point, we're going to be relying on politicians to do the right thing on behalf of voters and not simply act on the behalf of their own partisan agendas. All right. Well, we've just about reached the end of the hour, Steve. Um, I, I thought I would reserve, you know, 30 seconds or so for each of you, 30, 45 seconds to give us, you know, a lesson for the next election. Um, <laughs> this is the first election for some of our, uh, some of our audience, um, and it's, it's been exciting, <laughs> and it continues to be exciting. But what lessons would you share, uh, things we've learned things to look for in the next election, maybe issues that ought to be addressed between now and then. And I, and I guess we went, uh, we had uh, Ned first the last time. Why don't we go in, uh, in opposite order? I think Peter, could you, would you mind going first? Well, I was hoping to hear uh, the, the good ideas of my colleagues so I could just <laughs> you know, pick and choose. But um, really what, what I would love to see, uh, since I'm going first, I might as well be the most utopian. Um, I strongly believe that we need a constitutional amendment that creates a federal right to vote and that uh, take, that puts more control over the election of our national officers in the hands of the national legislature and takes it away uh, from, from the whims of states. Steve? Well, I would welcome that if we could get it. I will instead go with something that I think is uh, much more mundane, but perhaps achievable, which would be to have states in a much more widespread way reform their mail-in ballot processes so that it was clear how those processes were to work, so that it was streamlined, so that the ballots could be uh, screened and evaluated uh, in a pre-processing way before election day, um, so that the kinds of pre-election litigation we had this year about the mail-in ballot processes would not reoccur. Terry, it's to you. Um, yeah, I would say that um, we should be embracing patience, that all elections take a long time to actually count all of the ballots and we should be comfortable with that and we should not expect to learn from our television on the night of every election who won every every race and every issue that we should just be fine with. Let's step back and let the process count all the legitimate ballots, however long that, however long that takes. Thank you. Good advice. <laughs> Ned? I'll echo Peter's call for a constitutional amendment to uh, 
uh, protect the right to vote. Um, people think it's there, but it's not there. And if we could get a national movement to actually embrace it, I think it would be good both for law and for our culture. Well, thank you all. I, uh, on, on behalf of the Divided Community Project at the Moritz College of Law, let me thank, let me thank my colleagues at Election Law, uh, these, these four experts on constitutional law and election law for sharing these lessons and giving us some information that isn't driven simply by, by media, but is instead driven by their thoughtful study of the rule of law. Uh, I want to thank the Ohio State University and President Christina Johnson for this opportunity to talk to you all about this election and try to put some of this in context for you. Uh, and uh, lastly, I'd like to let you know that there's going to be a second conversation coming up in five days, I think it is. It's going to be on November 10, uh, a two, next Tuesday at 6 o'clock in the evening, 6 to 7.30. We're going to have uh, a dialogue, and it's called Unpacking the 2020 Presidential Election. Can we talk? Because in this time of polarized uh, partisan politics, it's difficult to talk to each other about this subject. And, and while we won't have the traditional Thanksgiving dinners coming up, probably with the relative we can't talk to about these things, we would like to talk to you about some of the lessons we've learned at the Divided Community Project that will help you navigate some of those conversations. We've got to, as a country, begin to talk to each other again across party lines, across racial lines, across religious lines, across immigration status, so that we can grapple with the issues that face us as a community. And we're going to do that on next Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have some brief presentations and then we're gonna hear from you so that you'll actually participate in breakout rooms and conversations. The registration link is in the chat function and you can find it in President Johnson's uh, message to the campus um, over the last couple of days. Uh, it has been a privilege to be with you. Uh, on behalf of all of us, thanks so much for tuning in.